This is the Tallahassee Business Podcast, bringing you engaging conversations with influential members of the community that you need to know. This episode is brought to you by The Health Network. The Health Network is an innovative advertising platform with more than 30 digital monitors and almost a dozen different medical waiting rooms throughout Tallahassee. With a diverse mix of medical practices, The Health Network provides advertisers unmatched visibility to a highly engaged audience while directly connecting with target consumers through static and video ads. To learn how your business can effectively reach over 60,000 patients and guests per month, visit THNAdvertising.com. Well, hello, everybody. This is Sue Dick with the Tallahassee Chamber. Very excited to uh, be talking with David Pollard, our Director of Aviation for the Tallahassee International Airport. David, welcome. I think by the end of this podcast, Everyone listening is going to know why we're an international airport. So let's just get that on the table now. Thank you, Sue. I'm very excited to be here and look forward to the opportunity. Well, David, I've known you for many years and I want to thank you. I have a tremendous amount of respect for you. We are lucky to have you here in our community. Uh, I know more maybe about you professionally and also personally just watching you over the years. And I want our listeners to really know who you are and how lucky we are to have you. You are a retired uh, veteran. And so thank you for your service, but important for people to know how you found yourself to Tallahassee and what your journey's been. Sure. Thank you. Well, two weeks out of high school, I joined the United States Marine Corps, uh, joined and uh, did a uh, complete enlistment. Uh, I decided I wanted to get out of the Marines and go to college. I went to college at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I graduated with a degree in airport management. Uh, But while I was going to college, I stayed in the United States Marine Corps Reserve. So uh, the whole time I was going to college and uh, many years thereafter, uh, I stayed in the Marine Corps uh, Reserves and ended up retiring in 2006. Well, and then you've been uh, at the uh, Tallahassee International Airport for how many years? Yes, I joined Tallahassee International Airport with the city of Tallahassee in September of 1994. So you can uh, you can give us the history of what we've seen at the airport. And that's what we're going to really get into today because there's so much going on. It is a um, enormous economic driver for us. And with your leadership and that of the city commission and obviously the city manager have really leveraged it, especially now. So we want to want to jump in here and um, maybe cover some ground with regards to the airport and some terminology and, and maybe um, give correct information out there, things that you can control, and there's things that just are out of your control, but I know you work very hard every day. So let's let's kind of jump right in. So if, if our listener has not traveled out of the airport, maybe in the last six months or even year with COVID, what would they see differently out there, maybe the difference between airside and, and landside? So sure, the, the number one thing they're going to see is a lot busier airport to start off with. Right as they turn off the roadway and enter the parking area, and they're going to see a much busier uh, parking facility. And that's a result of our increasing traffic that we have out there and generally in the increased levels of activity. So uh, just all the way around from commercial aviation to general aviation, uh, some of our development and capital programs, activities that we're working on with the projects, they're going to see a lot. So as they come up into the terminal, of course, they're going to see uh, lots of things with respect to uh, the new look that we have and the improvements that we've already made as they transition through the security checkpoint area, they're going to start to see a lot of construction. Well, and, and I've heard individuals say the line, the TSA line. So there's, there's a couple pieces to that, that you need to kind of give the great information so everyone doesn't think it's David Pollard's fault. I mean, and you just hit on it. You were charged with growing and increasing flights in and out and passenger. Um, arrivals and departures out of our airport. Individuals arriving to the airport might say, well, I've never been in a longer line with TSA. Explain how that works and what's really out of your control and and what you're doing to work towards fixing that in the future. Yes. So as we continue to grow, as we continue to recover those passengers that we lost during the onset of COVID, uh, we've uh, continually climbed up out of that. And uh, we're now within 10% of our 2019 numbers. So 2019, as you may recall, was a record year for us, which was the highest passenger traffic at our airport since 2007. Uh, We're positioned to now break that record and keep on going, which, by the way, happens to be one of our airport strategic priorities, which is 
uh, to surpass 1 million annual total passengers by 2024. Well, you have, uh, you stepped into your role reaching for the fence. I mean, you really outlined five key strategic priority areas. What are those? Yeah, so uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, you know, work with the city and the city leadership, our city manager, assistant city managers. And as we continue to press the way, press forward uh, towards our strategic priorities, you know, we, we work together and we laid out uh, five key priorities uh, for the airport. Uh, one is to surpass a $1 billion annual economic impact by 2024. Right now we're at about $599 million annual economic impact as measured by the Florida Department of Transportation. Our second goal is to surpass the 1 million annual total passengers, which I just mentioned. Uh, our third one is to surpass 22 million pounds of annual total cargo at the airport. So a focus on passengers and a focus on cargo activity. Also to develop 100 acres of land out of the airport and lease 100 acres of land. And finally is to complete construction of a U.S. Customs facility by 2024. That's an aggressive plan, and I think a lot of those um, priorities really support one another. So if we if we go into that international passenger processing facility and, and why we're an international airport, maybe talk about that and, and why that is so important for our region. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. So it is very important for our region as we've been working on this with the U.S. Customs and Border Protection and many others for many years. Uh, in fact, earlier today, I was just meeting with customs and, you know, I'm very pleased to say that we're going to be breaking ground on this customs facility here this month in, in May here. So as we you know, continue to uh, move ahead with that, uh, we're going to keep uh, pressing forward on our strategic goals and working towards that. So for customs, for, for our listeners, just maybe give an example of what that means and why that's so important. Yeah, so I call it building blocks. And so we're taking the next step. A while back, we laid out our path to international. As you can imagine, we changed our name. We went through some rebranding. Um, we've now completed the design on the facility. Now we're moving towards construction of the facility. And once we get customs here in this community, we'll be working to establish a foreign trade zone Right now, we're looking at a nine-county-wide foreign trade zone that, uh, if approved by the Foreign Trade Zone Board, uh, could possibly extend from uh, Port St. Joe to our west to the I-75 corridor to our east, which certainly ties to that strategic priority uh, to, to surpass a $1 billion economic impact. And for a company, what does that mean for a company that is manufacturing or wants to distribute? So uh, what we're going to do is, uh, as we move into that phase, after we get construction moving, uh, we're going to do uh, work with some consulting teams to uh, go out into those communities, into those counties, and do what I call a foreign trade zone 101 training. We want to work with the chambers and those different communities and other organizations to really educate uh, the business community. In the meantime, you'll also see us doing a lot more outreach. Uh, we recently put up a billboard uh, there by the airport, which simply says a world of possibilities. And that's what we want people to start to think about is, is what's possible out at this airport? What can we do? How can we tie to the business community? And how can we make it easier for them to do business? Well, I remember when you started on this journey, it's probably been now maybe six, seven years, uh, the chamber assisted you. You it wasn't just that you thought you wanted to do this and so you went and made an application. There were interviews and um, information pulled in from our reach and from companies indicating that they would utilize it as an example should it exist here. And so I think this has been a long process. It's, it's a very tedious process and it's really important. So David, credit to you and your team for staying focused on getting it done. Yes, and it does take a team. I, I give kudos to our airport staff, our consulting engineers and architects, and many others that uh, work with us uh, throughout the year as we continue to press forward and take those steps necessary uh, to get this thing established. What does the international designation mean for um, charters and flights? Because I think that was the first thing that comes to people's mind 
you know, were, will you be able to fly internationally? But what does that mean? Because that is also, I think, part of your business model with regards to charters. Yeah. So we designed the facility a little bit different, but uh, uh, it was important to me that we designed a facility that could handle both uh, charters. If you think of the typical aircraft, uh, let's just say an Airbus uh, A320 type aircraft might have over 100 people on board that aircraft. And uh, we designed the facility so that they could uh, fly in uh, from an international destination, a charter type activity, and clear customs and be out into the community within one hour. That was our goal. And so, um, but we also wanted to uh, be mindful of uh, the business aviation and general aviation, those that may want to fly in directly to our airport from an overseas destination. So uh, the International Facil Passenger Processing Facility actually contains two components to it. There's the, uh, the part, if we call it upstairs, that handles the larger aircraft. And there's a smaller, uh, what they call a general aviation facility, located uh, down on the uh, main ramp level. So does that mean, so many people may not realize your FBO, your fixed base operator, where Millionaire operates out of. So will they be able to use that? So if someone has a plane that they want to come in and out of or charter a smaller plane, they can clear customs yes, as well? Yes, that, that's it. And so we're, we're talking to Millionaire regularly. You know, we're trying to understand where are they getting these requests from, uh, and making sure that our timing is such that as soon as the facility is ready uh, to open and we have customs here, that we're going to be ready on day one. Okay. As far as construction, uh, car rental return. So if, if you're pulling in, there's other construction that's going to take place as well. Yes. Uh, well, we're uh, currently at 100% design of a new uh, rental car quick turnaround service facility. Uh, the name implies basically it's where they service those vehicles in the background. So it's currently across the street. Uh, uh, passengers don't typically go over to that area, but uh, it's a new service facility for those uh, rental car agencies. And they'll be able to service those vehicles, turn them around and get them right back to the ready return lot uh, so that we can make it convenient for our travelers. I get a lot of questions. Will I have to get on a bus to go get my rental car? No. Uh, we wanted to make it convenient and keep it uh, with the small uh, town charm that we have or, or the charm that we have, which is simply uh, you come in, you collect your bag, you go across, you get your rental car, and you go out to the car. And so uh, they won't have to get on a bus, but it's going to be a state-of-the-art facility. You know, I think that for all of us, we continue to know how important jobs are and keep up with um, the opportunities for everyone in our community and the region. And our airport does service a large part of our region. I mean, there's also land that is available to be uh, promoted and marketed, and that's something that you're working on as well. I, I think our listeners would be surprised to know really how many acres we have out at the airport, where both inside the fence and adjoining to outside the fence that you're out there actively trying to market as well. Yes, yes. We've done uh, advertising in uh, magazines like Site Selection, for example, uh, just trying to get our name out there, let people know that the land is available. Uh, and, and it's paid dividends. You know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting phone calls on the land and uh, we're actively negotiating with two major companies right now uh, to lease uh, up to 100 acres collected, uh, uh, collectively between those two. So, yes, we continue to uh, work on taking steps to develop the land, but it's also important to understand that uh, as people drive by the airport, uh, some of that land is protected by uh, some of our airspace rules, for example. So, if you think of the runway, we have runway safety areas and runway object-free areas and building restriction lines, and there's all these planning criteria that we have to work within as we work to move a project forward with, uh, in partnership with uh, the Federal Aviation Administration and the Florida Department of Transportation. You know, David, you have so many different enterprises out there, and I'm, I'm always impressed with how many different piece and parts you have to manage. And, and I think one of it, I want to go back to just the airspace discussion and what you all have done. Hopefully, our community has noticed military aircraft flying overhead and wondering why, why is there military aircraft? I think it's fascinating 
why that is and why that is so important in the revenue stream. And maybe you can explain what why that's occurring and why that's so important to the airport. Yeah, so uh, obviously, you know, we want to support the military and their activities within this community. Uh, but oftentimes it's important to me that I, uh, when I'm talking, I like to make sure that I'm talking about commercial aviation and military aviation and business aviation and general aviation. I think it's important for me in my role uh, to let those groups know that I understand that I uh, am certainly going to work with each aspect of aviation. And quite frankly, our job is to promote aviation in this community. So. Yes, so when we hear those military jets flying overhead, uh, they're doing their practice training, uh, routine training for them, uh, but they also might stop and take on fuel, for example. When they take on that fuel, they may be uh, paying a uh, what they call a fuel flowage fee. And some of those uh, revenues to us help us uh, operate the airport. And, you know, we don't take any money from the general revenue fund. So from that standpoint, uh, it's, a, it's a key revenue source for us in partnership with our uh, FBO service provider, Millionaire, uh, to support them, which also supports us. Everyone also wants to know they watch the airlines and how um, these mergers affect and, and whether they are going to start new flights or come into our community. Highlight the airlines that we currently have and what you're seeing out there, because people always wonder, why can't we get Southwest Airlines here? or Why can't we get another carrier? How is that world? And, and I know it's so competitive, but you all are focused on that as well. You actually go and meet with airline carriers and, and promote our community. Yes, we're always out there uh, continuously uh, working on air service development. So uh, that's that's just that's another important key thing that we do. Uh, obviously, it takes a lot of conversation, a lot of relationships to get to a point to when you can announce air service. Uh, we, we are active in negotiations with, uh, or in our discussions, I should say, with several airlines, but there's got to be a good fit. There's got to be a, a good business case for them to come into a new community, whether it's us or somewhere else. And so that's what we're oftentimes out there doing is educating airlines about our community, about some of the key projects, uh, some of the, uh, the drivers of our economic activity. And how they can make money within our community. Uh, yes, one of my key goals is to attract a low-cost carrier or ultra-low-cost carrier. Uh, that's something we continue to work towards. And, uh, uh, you know, as we continue our way ahead, I think, uh, you know, we've certainly developed some very good relationships there. But again, as I said, it's got to be a good fit uh, for both. And so, We'll continue those discussions and at the proper time, you know, hopefully one day we'll have a, a great announcement. And our passenger draw, how many miles uh, are you marketing the use of our airport to potential passengers? We typically go out 100 miles in every direction. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's good. Um, so I've got a couple. I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions here that people just assume that you can control and it's 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 all your fault. I'm going to put that in parentheses. And, and this is your chance to kind of clarify and maybe set the record straight. Even though I, I'm sure at the end of this, you'll say, and if anybody has ever wants to give feedback, they can certainly contact you because I know you've said that before, David. Yes. All right, so let's go back to the TSA. Who could, is it your responsibility to keep the lines short or long? And if not, whose responsibility is that? Well, I consider it a joint responsibility. We certainly, you know, I, 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 I'm not one to pass the buck or, or anything. I, I certainly will take ownership uh, at all times. But from the standpoint of, of the partnerships, uh, I oftentimes talk about the, the four legs of a table, the airlines, the TSA, our uh, fine men and women in, in police uniform, the police, and, uh, and the airport. And so, uh, all four of those legs need to support the table, or in this mm -hmm. case, the operations at the airport. So uh, in terms of the long lines, uh, it's certainly been challenging as our numbers continue to climb. Uh, but it's something that uh, we've now accelerated our planning efforts uh, in working with TSA. Uh, as those numbers climb, we're looking at the planning criteria needed to, uh, for example, add another screening lane. Mm -hmm. uh, and. That's one part of it. So the passenger screen is one part. 
uh, down on the lower level, many people may not know, but those bags are being screened. And so uh, the baggage handling and screening uh, of those bags. Uh, and so we're actively working with TSA and the partners up in Washington to uh, do a more in-depth study of our current activity levels, our projected activity levels, and then what I call some of the kickers, and that is uh, what is the impact of uh, say Amazon going to do for this community, right? Uh, they're coming. We see them in the airport at all times, right? And so as they continue to come in and out of this community and the things that will come along with it, uh, I think we're safe to say we're going to uh, be facing even higher levels of activity at the airport. So we want to accelerate our planning. Uh, we understand, we sympathize, we have extra staff that are uh, working those lines. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not going to press uh, those men and women front lines of TSA uh, to uh, move faster than they need to move to make in a safe, secure, and efficient environment for our traveling public. Well, I know anybody who's been there and, and see the interaction. Uh, I was in line myself and saw TPD, uh, our law enforcement, working to try and assist TSA and just try to ensure everybody stayed calm and patient, but, and it had to be a team effort. So credit to you, and, and, and you're right. I mean, TSA is doing a really important job. I think for, for a lot of our listeners, there's so many pieces that come to this. And I think as a community, we've all kind of started shaving the time off that we think we need to get to the airport, but we really don't. So how early should people get to the airport? Yeah, and that's I'm glad you asked that question because I, the, the official answer is please be at the airport at least two hours before your scheduled departure. I say at least uh, ahead of that. Uh, because I, I, it would be my preference that we not have a stressful experience when we're going to the airport. So the more time you give yourself, the less stress you're going to have. And uh, oftentimes I find people that aren't giving themselves simply enough time. So uh, it's very, very important to make sure that you're out ahead of your scheduled departure time to uh, park your car, get through ticketing. If you've done remote checking, check in, you know, get into your departure gate at least 45 minutes out ahead of that scheduled departure, right? So the airlines also have their cutoff times. And if you don't get to the ticket counter within a certain amount of time before your flight, or you don't get to the gate, uh, they may give your seat away. Right. Well, and I think that's why we, we kind of want to run through some of these questions, because I think individuals, passengers immediately go to, well, it's the city's fault or it's it's your staff's fault. And it's not. There's so many factors involved, like the airlines that have their own criteria that they have to work within. So um, we'll move it now to the other one. I, this actually happened when I was on a, a flight to, departing at 5.45 a.m. and the pilot would not take off because the tower wasn't ready to go. And I talked to you and you were great. You're like, well, that's there's there's some standards around that. So maybe clarify, because I think when we are as passengers or we have people coming in and out, it's our community and we're all very proud of our community. But there are some things that are just not in our control. So the tower and if that ever happens to a passenger, if you hear it, what's the answer to that? Yeah. So uh, our control tower, uh, again, the great people that work in air traffic control over there, uh, they staff the tower from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Now, from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m., does that mean you cannot fly into this airport? No. We have procedures in place with Jacksonville Center, uh, which is a major FAA control center out of Jacksonville. And we have procedures in place. Um, it's called a common traffic advisory frequency. You can turn on our runway lights with the uh, click of the microphone. Uh, you can uh, self-announce. Uh, we do regular inspections and things of that nature. So everything is in place for those operations to continue into the late hours of the, of the night. And uh, we're, again, we're a 24-hour facility and we can support the operations at any time. Your, um, your staff and your team are just remarkable. I've seen it firsthand. I have the opportunity to serve on the airport advisory in my role as the Chamber of Commerce. And and that group is there to support you, but we sit in those meetings and we really listen to all the work that you all are doing. Uh, with regards to the uh, jetways and or maintenance on aircraft, again, a lot of things occur, things happen, and you work very closely with the airlines. For a passenger or a traveler that might find themselves in that situation, maybe what are the scenarios that are typically occurring when that happens? 
whether it's jetway related, I know it's kind of a two-part, or if it's aircraft related. Yeah, so uh, at, at any given time, certainly things break sometimes. And so, um, you know, I am pleased to announce that uh, we just commissioned our first new passenger loading bridge, for example. Uh, these loading bridges at the airport of, uh, were the originals put on in 1989. And so we're now given those a life cycle upgrade. And I think the public is going to be very pleased once, when they see those new boarding bridges. Uh, we're replacing four of the eight that we have right now. But um, certainly an airline can have a mechanical at any time, which means uh, there's a problem with the aircraft itself. Uh, with our focus on safety collectively, whether it's the airlines, the TSA, the FAA, or the airport, uh, we're going to remain focused on safety and do the right thing for our travelers. And that, that means keeping them safe. If, if a passenger wants to communicate, if they, if they want to give feedback, um, both um, positively and or ask a question, what's the best way for them to do that? So uh, if they go to our website, tlhairport.com, uh, they can click the Contact Us button. Uh, that goes out to a group of us, so we immediately see it and we'll respond to the question and get you the information or answer your question that you may have. But uh, uh, we get pretty good usage of that and we're constantly asking, answering questions that people are throwing at us. Uh, one last thing, I wanted to go back. Um, within the terminal itself, other activity, other upgrades or renovations that people will see when they come in there in the near future? So I think, uh, again, the area beyond the checkpoint, um, which we call airside within the terminal. Uh, the A and B concourses are going to go through a major renovation. We're at the very early stages of that. That's going to start here uh, early May. And so as we get rolling with that, uh, please bear with us. Pardon our dust. Uh, good things are coming. So uh, if you think of the airside area of the airport, there will be new paint and finishes. We'll extend the terrazzo flooring down the middle where you see that heavily worn carpeted areas. Uh, and we'll be uh, extending the terrazzo and then putting new carpet in those gate areas themselves. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, uh, um, the passenger loading bridges are being replaced concurrently. Uh, on the back side of the B concourse is where we're building that international passenger processing facility. And a uh, fourth project that comes together with those three is a new flight information display system. And that's the system that people are typically looking at, the monitors within the airport. And so we're going to be giving those a, uh, an upgrade over the next uh, year and a half or two years here as we continue to plan that out, uh, look at the needs of the travelers, and also look at the uh, web interface as they can go on to our website and get that flight information as well. So, Well, I think you left off one, service animal facilities. Yes. Uh, again... <laughs> You know, one of the things that uh, I continually stress is is that entire passenger experience and journey. So uh, you've probably heard me say it before, but from roadway to runway, what is that journey look like? How is that experience? And so uh, whether it's pulling into our parking lot and the ticket spitter, um, you know, working correctly, right, and moving you through and getting to your gate and all, we want it to be the best passenger travel experience as possible. So as we continue to work towards adding uh, amenities and things that might set us apart, we did add a service animal relief area, and that's uh, for all pets, right? And so uh, from the standpoint of, um, you know, the public that might be traveling with somebody that just wants to get off their feet and uh, take care of their, their animal, uh, they can go out in that area, which is at the west end of the main terminal area. And it's just a quiet place for them to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Well, David, thanks for um, everything you do. There's a lot going on, and it's so important for our region. Um, and if the business community or our members can help in any way, I know that you'll um, you'll reach out and just keep keep doing great work with you and your entire team. Yes, I appreciate it. And certainly, yes, we're always open to thoughts, ideas, suggestions. Uh, this is our airport. This is our community. And certainly, I'm working to do everything I can to work with our great staff and uh, make the greatest impact that we can, provide the best experience that we can, but also let it serve as the true economic generator that it is. Well, thank you, David. Thank you so much.